Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. Did the Marine Corps' tardiness in deploying blast-resistant armored vehicles result in hundreds of Marines needlessly dying in Iraq? That was the finding of a civilian scientist employed by the Marines, a retired Marine himself. But when Franz Geil issued his report, he was ordered to cease any further work on the study by the Marine Corps. Welcome, Mr. Gal, to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Um, tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get to the Marine Corps to begin with? Well, I, uh, when I was uh, 16, I'd actually dropped out of high school. Back where were in you? Minnesota. I was in Minnesota. That's where mm -hmm. I grew up, in mm -hmm. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd uh, dropped out of high school and, uh, uh, in 1974, and uh, I had the mm -hmm. good fortune of meeting a Marine recruiter. And uh, so on my 17th birthday, I joined the Marine Corps. And uh, it's changed my life ever since, and I'm Marine to this very day. Uh, I enlisted, became, uh, first went to uh, the infantry, mm -hmm. and then subsequently I became a Marine security guard. Those are embassy guards. And when you left the Marine Corps five years later, what was your rank? I was a sergeant. Okay, and then I, what did you I do? Research. I worked in Germany for some time as I'm a dual citizen, uh, as I, I was a bodyguard for mm -hmm. the chairman of the board of, a, uh, of the Robert Bosch Corporation in, in Stuttgart, in the vicinity of Stuttgart. Did that for a little over a year, a year and a half, and then I came back to the United States and went to the University of Minnesota on Under the GI Bill. GI Bill, and you got a degree in? I got a degree in political science, and uh, and I missed the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So uh, what did you do? I uh, went down to the uh, uh, the officer selection officer and uh, 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 ended up going to officer candidate school, mm -hmm. and I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the in the Marine Corps. That was in 1983, and uh, after a little delayed entry, uh, 1984, I I was back in uniform. Um, and I became an infantry officer at that point. Mm -hmm. I had uh, been in the infantry beforehand when I was enlisted and wanted to do that again. And you stayed in until when? I stayed in until uh, uh, to the rank of major, and I retired after a total of 22 years of active service in, in 2002. And but you stayed connected to the Marine Corps even after you left the Corps. Yes, I mean, yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to leave the Marine Corps. I, I never, never uh, want to leave the Marine Corps. And, uh, but I got to the point where I couldn't get promoted anymore as a major, beyond major. And so I became a civil servant. I was mm -hmm. hired back as a civil servant. And because I had been to graduate school in Monterey, California, at Naval Postgraduate School, I had some skills that qualified me to be uh, a, a science advisor, science and technology advisor. So mm -hmm. I was hired back uh, with that as being one of my primary functions mm -hmm. at Headquarters Marine Corps. All right. Now let's fast forward to uh, 2005, I believe. Um, and you were uh, working on a study um, about uh, armored resistant vehicles. No, no, not, uh, not in 2005. Okay. 2005, I was uh, doing many other varied things right. at Headquarters Marine Corps uh, as, a, uh, as a science and technology advisor, uh, looking at many advanced technologies for, that might have utility mm -hmm. in the conflict we were in. Uh, in 2006, or in 2005 to 2006, I was sent to school, another graduate school, the National Defense University. And upon graduating from there, uh, I returned to my Pentagon position. And it was around that time that I was invited by the commanding general of Marine Forces in western Iraq, in Al Anbar province. Let's, let's, let's move back a little bit. You, you know, we're talking about now 2007? We're talking 2006 now. 2006, okay. And we're in 2006, and what is your position at that time? I'm still the, uh, I'm, again, the science and technology advisor. Uh, is one of my main functions at uh, Headquarters Marine Corps to one of the deputy commandants. Okay. The, it's called the deputy commandant for plans, policies, and operations. 
And so you were saying you were contacted by? I was contacted by uh, one of my previous supervisors from years past, uh, who was now the commanding general in Western Iraq, uh, Multinational Forces West, MNFW, we call it. And that was in the, during the difficult period in Al Anbar province, where we were suffering many, many casualties from various, it's just a tough time, and you probably remember that from the press. And uh, I was asked if I wanted to come over and assist with some of the, we'll call it bureaucratic challenges, um, because there, were, there was obviously equipment that was needed by the Marines over there that they were not receiving. And equipment that had been requested through the bureaucracy in the, in the rear, but they weren't getting it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Before we go any further, I just want to point out uh, and clarify that you're speaking in your individual capacity right now. You're not speaking on behalf of the Marine Corps, is that correct? I am today on leave mm -hmm. for this purpose. Okay. Uh, not di for this purpose, I'm, I'm on leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yes, I'm speaking in my own capacity, not as a civil servant, uh, not as a representative of the Marine Corps. Um, I'm speaking as Franz Geil, the private citizen. Okay. And you were saying about you were finding these deficiencies in the types of materials that existed in the field. Right. There were the various systems that, that I was aware of, some of them in, in mature, some of them being developed that uh, would potentially mitigate many of the casualties and the circumstances that the Marines were running into over there. All right. Well, let's talk about one. This is something called an MRAP. What is that and what does it do? The MRAP is uh, an acronym for the Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicle. It's a mouthful. It's a big armored truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's nothing new. It's, uh, it's a design, uh, a vehicle concept, and a design, and a product, and products that have been uh, first developed actually earlier in the 20th century, but primarily later in uh, the... Uh, in the bush wars mm -hmm. in South Africa. And what's it used for? For working in an irregular warfare environment where bombs, improvised bombs, improvised explosive devices are used as a weapon of choice, especially by an, uh, an, an enemy force that is, is outmatched in numbers and perhaps technologies. Improvised bombs are very effective against, against vehicles. And our, our legacy vehicles, the vehicles like the Humvee, as we call it, high, mo uh, um, high mobility multipurpose wheeled vehicle, <laughs> Humvee. Yeah. The, the Humvee is our, is our standard mm -hmm. uh, troop carrier. Not so what's the difference between an MRAP and a Humvee in terms of their ability to withstand some kind of roadside bomb attack? Well, in terms of, in terms of just that protective quality, I mean, the, the MRAP is, is far superior. It was designed for that purpose. Mm -hmm. It was tailored, uh, tailored designed from the ground up with a, what we call a V-hull, disperses blast. It's a little bit higher off the ground, so the blast is already uh, dispersed a little bit by the time it reaches the vehicle. It's got, uh, it has its modular parts that kind of falls apart, but it protects the crew inside, and you can easily reassemble these things. Uh, uh, if they've been taken back to the depot. It's been designed from the ground up to protect the crews and the passengers and uh, as well as to as well as to uh, protect against all the primary injury causing mm -hmm. uh, uh, aspects of an explosion. And, and what you wrote in your report is that had there been these MRAPs in place rather than the Humvees, that hundreds of deaths could have been avoided. Yes, and actually, long before I wrote that report, I, as I said, I went to Iraq, I saw the issues, and I did not, it wasn't me who came up with the idea that there was a problem. Mm -hmm. Other Marines, uh, commanders that uh, I was either working for or the staff that I was working with, brought all these issues to my attention. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not something I invented out of thin air. And there had been Marines who had studied the issue of armor in years past and done papers and, and theses on this. 
I was just introduced to the topic. All right. Well, now, with all of this support from other Marines who mm -hmm. were expert in this area, I assume that when the request got back to Quantico that they said, sure, let's do that. Well, no, no, they didn't. And uh, there are many reasons for this, and I guess this gets to the whole psychology of bureaucracy. Um, but obviously, uh, to, when you have already purchased one system, let's say the Humvee, and you have, uh, you have a very cost-effective contract and, uh, and, and a whole business case built up, and everything is moving, and you've got these things, you're producing them and pumping them out, and, 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 and a very stable program. It has only so much money, and now you get a request for something that is unknown, that is essentially not invented here is what we use the term, that will compete against those resources. Well, the, the business case is, is in jeopardy. And that money would have to be taken away from uh, existing programs and applied to something new that's being asked for, something completely foreign. So I get it. So the Marine Corps brass was saying, well, look, this is an unknown. It's going to cost us money. We have something in place. We're sticking with what we got. Uh, what did, and so what did they do with your report? What did they do to you? Well, again, this is all prior to the report. These things that I'm describing mm -hmm. here happened uh, even partially before I ever went to Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, the report just happened to be the pinnacle of when I was starting to report on it right. uh, officially. Um, and that came later. It's the brass is our Marines in uniform, general officers. And, you know, I love my Marine Corps, and they're my brothers and my sisters. And I don't think any Marine uh, would, would consciously make a decision that would, would be contrary to the best interests of the, of the Marines in the field. But what happens is, is back here in the, in the what we call CONUS, Continental United States, and the support establishment and the bureaucracy, what we often identify as the Pentagon, is that we have a civilian infrastructure underlying that, that often has a completely different set of priorities, of incentives, uh, that by the very nature of being a civilian bureaucracy uh, may have objectives and incentives that are, that are in contradiction with the best interests of the Marines, the uniformed Marines in the field. That's just the psychology of the, of the bureaucracy, and, and it's... it's, it's uh, well, it's let's, let's, let's move forward to the report being issued. What was the consequence of the report being issued? Well, the consequence of the report being issued was that the, the from my pers what, what I had observed, the, the, the call it the evidence that I had, that I had available to me, uh, was compelling enough for certain people in Congress, certain members of Congress, um, uh, to ask for the Inspector General to take a closer look. And so as a consequence of my reports, these Inspector General audits were conducted, one on the MRAP and one on another weapon system that, uh, that I can talk about later. So that's the real outcome of that, is, is gaining visibility, bringing it into the light to see, okay, how did this happen? And that was one of my main objectives. In terms of getting the armor moving uh, to Iraq, that had happened already beforehand. Uh, Secretary Gates became... So it was this process you were talking about uh, up until the report time where feedback was coming in that this exactly. is really what we need. Exactly. I mean, uh, it became clear, and, and our, our good Secretary of Defense made it crystal clear to, to the services, uh, that, uh, and especially in the case of MRAP, he made it one of his top priorities. In mm -hmm. fact, I think it was the number one priority program for a period of time at so, the Pentagon. So you're now, you must be treated as a hero at, uh, for, for having brought this forward, is that right? Well, no. <laughs> it's, I went outside the family. And I'm not, you know, again, I'm not, I'm, I am one of many. I'm just the point, I'm, I'm, I'm the visible aspect of this. There are many, many Marines behind me. I think it's convenient for me to represent the issue publicly because I'm better protected than the Marine in uniform. There are so many Marines behind me that have brought the issues to my attention that are much more vulnerable than me. Nonetheless, what happened to you? Okay. Well, in, in my case, yeah, it wasn't well received. I think the leadership 
in the Marine Corps. First of all, I'm a Marine, and I, I went outside the family to get visibility on this subject to get some of the problems solved. And, and I understand my family, and, and that is it's a, some, it's the last thing a person wants to do. Uh, I never dreamed of being a whistleblower, and it's the last thing I'd want to do. It's, it's, it's kind of contrary to our, 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 our concept of loyalty. But at the same time, you've got to say things when, when it's important enough. Well, I'd gone outside the family, and there were probably many thought that he didn't need to do it that way. There, he could have come to us. He could have done it differently. Well, it well, wasn't realized that I had attempted all those, those avenues, and they, they, were, they were denied to me. So um, the response was more of an, uh, uh, an automated response. He's not obeying our instructions. <laughs> He's, uh, he's gone off the reservation, as we often say. Uh, and we've got to stop him from doing that. How did they do that? Well, the first step was, and I, say, I have to say that this is largely driven by civilian bureaucrats in my organization, and not so much by the, the officers themselves. Uh, but the officers are the signatories to various uh, you know, reprisals and punishments, and so that's, that's what they take on board. But first thing, uh, formal counseling in writing from my, one of my civilian supervisors and a military supervisor right over me. Okay, so, well, that wasn't effective because I was still convinced that these issues needed to be discussed and aired, and uh, a couple kind uh, members of Congress came to my assistance, and uh, the press took an interest in the, in, in the issue. And because I was having my ability to contact the chain of command through the Pentagon or anywhere else kind of capped by my own organization. Well, then I continued my communications uh, with, with uh, staffers and, uh, and, and on occasion the press. Then came a formal reprimand. This is a more informal. <laughs> when did this uh, happen? Uh, it was in mid-2007. Okay. This is, I've already been home maybe six months. And what did the reprimand say? The exact words were, uh, I f it came down to failing to follow the instructions and the directions that were given to me. Don't do this. In this case, it was contacting Congress without prior approval or something related to that. And, and I, now today I understand because of the kind assistance and advice that you know, the GAP has given me. Um, I know that I was within my rights. But at the time, I really didn't care whether I was in my rights or not. That wasn't the point. That wasn't the issue. I wasn't worried about my rights or what happens to me if I'm going to get hit over the head for doing this. The issue was getting, getting the bureaucracy fixed so they couldn't allow something like this to happen again. Because yes, many, many Marines uh, probably uh, lost their lives or were maimed when they didn't need to be because there, was, there were knowing decisions made that allowed that to happen. And I, d I just didn't think that was right. This has, a, this has an impact on future conflicts. So, official reprimand. So I can you know, continue to be my off the reservation self, I guess. And uh, then came the proposal to suspend me. And I, I approached the Office of Special Counsel on a few occasions, but my and for the same reason. For the same reason, all the same stuff. Follow all orders. the same stuff. And uh, eventually, I, I think I contacted you guys and, and, and that government. That would be the Government Accountability that Project. Government Accountability Project, and you guys have been wonderful. Um, you know, I, I really don't believe I would have my job today uh, if, it, if it wasn't for you. But yet, you're an outsider. You're outsiders. You're outside the system. It would be nice to know that, I, you know, that in the future, if someone has, stands in my shoes and sees the things that I've seen, uh, could relatively safely bring these issues up, even if it makes other people uncomfortable, without getting punished for it. Well, let's, and, and I appreciate that. What is your current legal status? My current legal status, well, let's see. After my proposal for suspension, uh, then came some other uh, interesting things. Uh, I've, my most recent punishment was a uh, performance, improval, performance improvement program. I think uh, nicknamed a PIP. Well, that's usually <laughs> what civil servants get right about before they're before they're about to get fired. And it's, saying it's establishing a record of bad performance exactly. for purposes of taking a and I, and I personnel have, action. And I have quite a record of bad performance now in my file. And uh, 
and, and whether or not, I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to accept that. I can live with that, you know, as long as the problems get fixed, because I want to remain focused on the issues. I'm, I still feel very lucky to have the job that I do, and I, you know, I'm honored to be able to still be in the Marine Corps, but I don't think this should have happened. And I don't think I should be punished for doing something that I think is right. Well, I'm on an extension, supposedly I'm on an extension of this performance improvement program, this PIP. Uh, I probably am to the, I'm probably not performing, as I was told on my most recent counseling, I'm not performing at all to the expectations of the PIP, and uh, that I, but I've been given a little bit of extra time to improve myself somehow, and, and that's fine. I, you know, I will, will. Has there been any change at all in how you've been treated of late? Yes. Um, I can only put it this way. In, again, it's unique to the military. The civilian bureaucracy stays in place. The officers above that bureaucracy, they come and they go. And they're refreshed over time. And the Marine Corps kind of moves on. That's one, one wonderful thing. And with the exception of some intense difficulties that I still have with the civilian bureaucrats that I deal with that are immediately over me, as well as my history of difficulty with the bureaucracy that I, that I addressed in the first place. I don't know. I, I, I have a new feeling now, and it's only because I was able to stay there because of your support and then some members of Congress that I'm still here. But only because you allowed me to survive this long, I think the Marine Corps is getting over it. I think any Marine would have done exactly the same thing, even these, whether they be a high-ranking general or another mar Marines of, 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 of lower rank would do exactly the same thing that I did having been in my shoes and having made my observations. Well, I like, and I think they know that themselves. I like to believe that's true. I'm not so sure that it is true, and, but it does answer, I think, probably my last question. Knowing now, having been put through the ringer for having done this, knowing now um, what happens to people who uh, take a stand like you did, would you have done it again? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a Marine. I mean, we have to, you know, this is my family, and I recognize a, 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 a great danger, a great threat to my family, uh, now and in the future, and absolutely do the same thing. Um, getting beat up over it, well, that's just that's part of the price. So. Well, many thanks to Franz Geil for standing up for the safety of American troops. Uh, well, Pentagon officials tried to fend off Guile's criticism by wrapping themselves in patriotic cloaks. It seems they were also wrapping American troops in flag draped caskets. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work. <laughs>